So a few things that you want to consider when setting up a portrait that you're painting from life um, in sight size is you want to be able to have space to step back um, and the very minimum that you would need in order to like really get like enough perspective um, on the painting and the model uh, and see it sort of like in a more impressionistic way and see the whole picture is uh, to have at least three times the length of the piece that you're working on. So I'm doing a 50 by 60 centimeters portrait. And so this is probably more than 180 centimeters from the distance to me to the canvas, which is side by side with the model. Another thing is when you're setting it up, uh, light will be reflecting off of like every surface. So if you have like a sort of shiny floor or a really light floor, it'd be good to put down a carpet. Um, and then as far as the wall, this was uh, a lot of light was reflecting off of the wall onto the model's face. And so there, the shadows weren't as like deep and dark and they're getting washed out. So I hung up this uh, black cloth. And then another thing is when you're painting um, from natural light, uh, it's best to have like north facing uh, windows. you're going to want to find a sort of platform to put your model on so that when you're painting the model, you're not sort of uh, having this dis like distorted perspective of looking down um, at the model or, you know, it's not always that great looking up if the model is super tall and you're really short. I guess there's not really much you can do about that. <laughs> dig a hole <laughs> um, and I don't really have that problem for me it's usually I'm looking down at models uh, and so I'll have to get really creative and like find sort of like bricks or like pieces of wood or pallets um, and just try and stack the um, platform up so that the model is a bit higher you know you at least want it at eye level and there's like a little bit more of a presence, you know, of the, the model is sort of uh, maybe slightly higher than your eye level, like looking down. And then it's also good to have eye levels for when you're taking measurements rather than having to sort of like have the, your arms up and looking up and or rather down. You can just sort of like have it straight out and it'd be more consistent. This is our model, Arnie. Um, thank you for coming in. <laughs> And uh, we're going to be doing a portrait of him. Um, so I'm going to step back and sort of try in a variety of different poses to see what looks sort of best. Um, going to try and keep it simple. Don't want to have like a you know, don't want to like put the model in too much strain, but I like also don't, I want to make it easy on myself for like getting the drawing, um, but still keep it a little bit interesting and like dynamic. So I'm going to start with trying to see his face turning this way. So if you turn that way, Arnie, thank you. 
that's nice. Um, and then maybe even a bit farther, we could see what profile looks like. Okay, there we go. Got some nice highlights in the eyes. Um, and then let's go ahead and have you turn your face. Yeah, there we go. That's the other profile. And then a little bit more towards me. Okay, is that his, like his whole face is in shadow. Um, and then a little bit more towards me. Okay, that's really nice. We got like a classic Van Dyke Z um, where you can see on the top of his eyebrow, his right eyebrow, and then going along the ridge of his nose and then under the nostril, where you sort of have like this nice shadow shape. Um, and that's really good for, not only is it like create like in interesting design of shapes in the portrait, but also um, really helps us sort of lock in the features the more we focus on that. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the model is a little bit below my eye level, so I'm gonna have him sit on this cushion here. Thanks, Arnie. Um, to give him a little bit more height. How's that? Which way? Is that good? <laughs> Very good. Yeah, so that's much better. You can kind of see the highlights in his eyes a little bit better as well. Um, and so I'm gonna also turn his shoulders a little bit in the opposite direction of his face. So if you could just turn the chair in this direction. Yeah, there we go. And that way we get um, much more interesting sort of gesture with the the neck and the 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 body and the the head. So if you turn your face this way now, yeah, very good. And then your eyes here. Okay, cool. So I'm really happy with this. Um, I'm gonna try some t-shirts. Um, get like interesting colors and rhythms and shapes. Uh, Right now it's a sort of just like flat white shape from the t-shirt. So we'll go ahead and, um, well actually before I do that, the, the background is kind of the most essential uh, part. The, the value relations between the, the portrait and the background really sort of um, dictate what sort of uh, image we're going to be making. It, it's all about like the relationships of like values and edges and how atmospheric you want the painting to be. So I'm going to go ahead and have Emily help me hang up. Let's try this blue one here. Um, so you can basically just go to any sort of like fabric district and or like craft store and get some fabrics. And I try and not get too sort of like saturated colored ones because it sort of takes away. I like just more like uh, earth tones. Um, and that's really nice. Uh, let's try this darker gray one. Thanks. Very good. So you can see that he, with this one, it's a little bit more um, uh, atmospheric, like the, the, the contrast between his hair and the shadows and his skin are a little bit um, more blurred with the background because they're closer in value. And, you know, I don't think it's quite as interesting as an impact. Um, and then, of course, we have like the, the background we have now, and I think that um, is what we're probably gonna end up going with because it brings out the, the cools and the highlights and complements the nice warm flesh tones and the lights, and it has good contrast with the hair. Um, and so I think that's what we're gonna go with. Um, and then, I'm gonna go ahead and try some different shirts. We have this one, which matches the, the background quite closely, which could have a really interesting effect, kind of like a monochromatic 
um, painting. The white shirt's really important because it adds a sort of accent that sort of brings you into the painting, leads you up to the highlights in the eyes. Um, and I always sort of try and find some way to add a sort of uh, either light shape or dark shape within the clothes to sort of like lead your eye in. Um, then we have this blue. It's quite cool. Looks good with the skin. Got the red earrings. And then this yellow one. Um, they're all really nice. This is, I always have like really hard time like picking which one to go for. Um, he's even got this really nice gold jewelry in his hair, which looks good with the yellow, but let's try the, that one again. I think I'm going to go for that. I, yeah, the, so if you could put that on, um, the colors are just, it really brings out like the colors in his skin. And when I'm looking at, um, the model, you'll notice that I'll sort of be squinting a lot. Um, and I do this to sort of simplify the painting. Um, it, it, it makes, it allows me to sort of see the, the colors and like j more, or more so like the, the shapes as like unified shapes. And I'm not really seeing all the details and the, the face and the portrait rather, I'm just sort of, uh, seeing it as, um, a more simplified image. And this um, this helps me set up my composition. Uh, yeah, because then I can just focus on like the big shapes. All right, so if you turn your face, yeah, very good, and then your eyes here. Because that's what I'm most like uh, interested in, is like sort of like composing like a portrait in terms of like a, the bigger shapes because the details and eyes and stuff like that it's if you have a nice light source and a nice model it's inevitably going to be sort of interesting so for me i just want to make sure that i have like a a good a good pose in terms of big shapes and so i'm closing one eye as well because that uh allows me to see it in a, a flatter two-dimensional way um and it, there's less distortion with the perspective. And so when I, I'll just close my eye, kind of put my hands together and make a frame around the model. And I'm really liking the pose that we have right now. So what you want to do when you're setting up a portrait, if you're gonna be doing it to the scale of life, you're gonna to wanna to try and line it up with the model. And I'll tell you a bit more about that sp more specifically in a moment. Um, okay, let's try that. You sit there. Thank you. Okay, so now let's see how close we are. Very good. So I have my canvas. Um, could you actually turn all the way this way? So you want the, if you're doing a life-size portrait, you want the canvas to be lining up somewhere between the, uh, like his temple and the, his, his ear. Um, and if you just line up the painting, uh, somewhere within that range, uh, it'll be a life-size portrait. The farther back you go behind the head, the bigger than life-size it's going to be. The farther forward you go, the, um, smaller it will be. Because sight size is a method of, you can relax. <laughs> Sight size is a method of visually comparing um, the subject and your canvas. And you have a sort of one-to-one -one ratio. So, like I said, if it comes forward, the perspective will make it so that it's smaller than life size compared to your subject. Um, 
or well, they're comparing them, they will all be the same, always be the same size. And then the um, farther back you go, the bigger. So right now, I have it just behind his eye, that's temple, and I'm going to make sure that the top is just a few inches above his head. If you could turn just a little this way, yeah, and then your eyes here. And then the bottom sort of, you know, let's see, I'm going to, could you bring your hair forward on this side? Yeah, brilliant. And then, is it all right if I move your hair? Okay, so we're going to have some there, and then maybe a few strands here. Yeah. Okay. Really nice. I like how that sort of like adds a length to the um, portrait. It's really nice and elegant. Um, I'm going to bring the shirt in just a little bit. There we go. Yeah, I'm really liking this. Those earrings are super cool. And so like I said, the top of the easel, as you can see here, is just a few inches above his head. And then the bottom of it, just enough room for the hair. Um, it's looking really good. And those are the heights. This is a plumb line. Just a bit of thread, um, sewing thread, whatever. Um, and a bit of metal ring to have a weight. And I'll be using this to take my measurements. So I keep my sort of shoulders relaxed and then I just lock my elbows, close one eye to flatten the image. Um, and my dominant eye is my left eye. Uh, I think you'll just sort of over time It'll just come naturally, like which I you observe with. Um, and then I'll sort of try and keep the line as perpendicular as possible. And I would take measurements, you know, top of the model's head. Um, and then my, the plumb line leads across the canvas. And then I would make a note of that. Um, it's my charcoal. Got need some charcoal. Got my kneaded eraser. Um, you can also use. Uh, so yeah, the thing is with sight size and the plumb line and taking measurements, I honestly will just grab a brush, take the top, take the bottom, maybe the bottom of the nose and then sort of just go from there. Um, but that's after having developed, you know, my eye and my, I've just like done a lot of portraits. So don't be too dependent on taking measurements. I would recommend taking as little as you probably could. Um, and just using your eye, you know, it's a visual process. So flashing your eye from the sitter to the canvas and just seeing, you know, rather than measuring whether it needs to go up or down, just seeing whether it goes up or down. And then if you really can't tell, then that's when you can use your plumb line to double check. And so like I said, like, it's important to keep the model at like uh, like eye level so it's not distorted. It's also important to uh, not lift your head up when you're taking measurements or lifting it down. You sort of just want to like keep your head straight and then make the measurements from there um, to have it as accurate as you can. But like I said, don't take too many measurements. <laughs> um, okay, very good. This is the pose. Brilliant. So today I'm going to be starting um, with a transfer drawing. And I have some Canson paper here, which has like a nice mid-tone. It's not like a bright white. I got my Nitrum charcoal. This is the green one. I think that's B. It's soft. And then we also got some kneaded eraser.
It's definitely good if you're beginning to learn how to paint um, because it allows you to sort of work out the the drawing and the proportions and all the like big shapes um, on the paper with charcoal because the charcoal is much easier to move around and then you can transfer that to the canvas so that rather than working it out in paint on the canvas where it can get sort of like messy and um, it, yeah I guess it's when you don't have like a very confident uh, like handling of the paint um, or like getting the drawing straight away it is definitely helpful to do it on the paper first um, and so that's what we're going to be um, doing today one thing as well is like when you're paint when you're doing a painting sometimes it'd be hard uh, sort of placing it in the right place on the canvas um, and so when you're doing it on the paper it allows you to sort of place it when you're transferring it where you want on the canvas which is nice uh, because it's sometimes hard to like place it in the right place right away and you know you don't really want to have to like move your painting <laughs> after you've done it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so top of the head. Considering raising the canvas just a little bit because I would like to um, and in all, in all honesty, I guess I don't really have to do this because it is a transfer and I can just place it where I want to at a later time. But it's good to try and get it exactly as you plan to initially. Because if you were painting this on the canvas, um, you would have to make sure you're getting it right the first go. So I'm going to just sort of adjust it. I'm going to bring my canvas farther up so that his head is placed a little bit lower um, on the canvas. Okay, brilliant. So it's important to take as much time to set up as necessary. Um, it takes a while to get used to the easel. Um, Sometimes you might feel that it's taking forever to choose the background and the clothes and the jewelry and all these different things that are incorporated in a portrait. But um, my teacher, Charles Cecil in Florence, his teacher, Gamel, always said that if you create a, uh, he always said, create a masterpiece in nature and then just paint it. Um, so that's what you just gotta try and do. If you can create it in nature and then paint it, yeah, and then so what I'm going to do here is I'm hanging this bag that's full of sort of like paints and oil and stuff and clamps and I'm just going to have Arnie hanging on that uh, knob back there and now that's going to sort of put some more weight on my easel so it's a bit more secured. It's definitely useful to do that when you're like landscape painting, plain air, because um, it takes a while to get used to an easel and have it be stable. <laughs> All right. So there we go. I mean, I can bring the head down a little bit after my <laughs> adjustments. Um, and you want your easel as close to the model so that you can just sort of compare the um, the model and your painting as easily as possible. Not too much distance between the two. 
and the top, bottom. It's just checking if those are in the right place. The bottom of his chin can come up. Okay, and then I'm gonna go in and get his eyebrow. Emily has a aversion to using tape, I've noticed. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> So we're back from our model break and gonna try and, yeah, Ari's in the pose. Um, could you try like moving your, your knees and your shoulders in this direction? Yeah, if that's possible. Yeah, brilliant. And then, yeah, very good. And turn your face just a bit towards me. Yeah, there we go. So we're getting some nice light on the left side. Um, on his cheekbone, it's looking really good. And you know, it's important to always make sure that the canvas is in the right position. Yeah, and like if your model like like chooses a spot on the wall and if you wanna like mark that with a piece of tape or whatever so they can remember where it is, that's definitely um, helpful. Do you know where you're looking, Arnie? Just up there. Yeah. Well, no, I want you to look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, great. So turn your face just a slight, yeah, a little bit this, there we go, perfect, okay. And then I'm gonna check my top. Top's looking good. The bottom of the chin is there. And then we got the eyebrow. Okay, now I'm gonna go in for the bottom of the nose. So, I've got my heights. Now I want to see where I'm gonna place him. And so, on the canvas. And so I could either, I'm gonna sort of make a school uh, rectangle around the canvas with my fingers and then just sort of carry that over to him. And yeah, sort of, it's gonna be pretty central more or less. So. What I can do actually is get a measurement of the painting by using the brush um, and marking it with my from the end to where my thumb is, with my arm stretched out. So that's the width of my canvas, and then I'm going to sort of place that over him. And right now, I actually have the edge of the canvas where I'd want the edge of the painting to be in relation to his portrait. So basically this distance is the same as this distance. <laughs> and so I can therefore take a measurement from the side of the canvas to his head and then just compare it. So I'm going to do that back from here, my position, which is at least um, three lengths of the portrait that you're doing. So when you're painting from life size, and, or when you're painting from life with the model um, and sight size, you want to be able to have at least three times the distance to step back um, from your project. So I'm doing a 50 by 60 centimeter portrait. So I'd want, at say, 60, 120, 180 centimeters um, distance to step back. Um, so I think I have um, a bit over that, which is good. You want to get as much distance as possible. That's the minimum distance. And so I'm standing all the way back here in this corner, and I'm trying to be in the same position. It's quite easy for me to go in the same position because it's in this corner, but um, whether you need a tape where your feet go or um, that'd be helpful. Um, and then 
I want to make sure that every time I make a mark, I'm stepping back so that I can be comparing them. Um, sight size isn't about making measurements. It's about looking and observing. And so that's why I want you to take as little measurements as possible because I don't want it to become a sort of, um, I don't want you to become dependent on having to measure everything. I want you to be able to develop your eye and compare the marks that you're making from your, to your model. So, like I said, I'm going to get some widths now. So I'm measuring the side of his face to the side of my canvas, and then I'm going to carry it on over to my canvas. And it lies there. Then I'm going to get the measurement of this, his head. And... like it's here. Now, I'm actually going to want to bring it just a little bit. I don't want it right in the center. I kind of want him a little bit off to the, the right side of the canvas. So that Yeah, I just think that's going to look better, have a better composition. And, of course, we're transferring it so we can transfer it sort of wherever we want to on the canvas, but it's a good exercise to sort of think about these things um, in the early stages and um, make these decisions early on. So we're going... So now check the eyebrows, check the nose... Raise the eyebrows a little bit. Okay, let's see. Getting the Van Dyke Z. And then getting the cheekbone. Then I'm going to go ahead and measure um, where the uh, ear is. And placing the ear in relation to the other features is pretty important because that can really show you um, the tilt of the head, whether the chin is too high up or too far low, because you'll start to see that the, you know, the nose in comparison, to, the ear doesn't really move. So those, you want to be relating those quite often. Um, so that's the bottom of my ear. And then... Let me go ahead and I'm going to be taking less and less measurements. I'm going to go ahead now and get the bottom of the lip. And you can see I'm using straight lines. It's because I'm, one sec, pit of the neck is pretty essential because that's not going to be moving either. Um, so you want to lock that in pretty early on. And it's important to get that in relation to the, the head because um, you don't want 
the head to look sort of severed from the the body. Um, so again, like I said, I'm using straight lines so that I can have a more simple mark of what I'm, I'm just getting the proportions, um, the big shapes, because I'm not looking at the details, basically. And a lot of what I'm putting down is not going to be, you know, dead on accurate. But that's not the point. I got to put something down in order to sort of flash my eyes back and forth and compare it to the model and see, you know, what needs to, what sort of adjustments need to make. I've like I've sort of like noticed that I tend to start kind of big, um, and then as the drawing goes along, it I sort of kind of like chisel into it and make it a little bit smaller. Um, but a lot of people do the opposite, so. Just know that it's always sort of changing. Allow yourself that, you know, that room to make errors um, so that you can correct them. And again, squinting and seeing these sort of like geometric abstract shapes within the face, simplified. And in school, they used to like have us try and you know, see whatever sort of shape that we could. I'm gonna go ahead and get the nostril. The nostril really helps us sort of lock in face. Okay, another thing is that when you're making these, um, these marks, these sort of like long, straight marks, a way to sort of um, try and get them as accurate as possible is you can sort of Put your piece of charcoal, you know, I have it on the, his, the shoulder on the right. And you can almost imagine as like a, a hand on a clock and sort of like, what time is that telling? And 
or actually the if I go to the, his uh, right shoulder, I feel like mine's a bit too steep and it could be a little bit more gradual. And so you could do that with all the lines that you're making there. Can you get the size of his mustache? You don't want to be going in with loads of values. Um, it's sort of just, I got my light and my dark. And I can just sort of push and pull those shapes until in the right place. Okay. And I'm just flashing my eyes back and forth and I feel that there's a little bit more length to his, his face. So I'm adding a bit to the chin. I'm gonna go ahead now and let's see. Bro. Again. Checking to make sure it's in the right spot. And then Yeah, it's helpful to study um, the anatomy of the face as well. Um, I studied anatomy pretty extensively. I didn't remember any of the names really of like all the bones and muscle. So you don't really have to know the names in order to see them and sort of understand their structure. Um, got my charcoal here. They've gone quite dull from drawing. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get this sort of like cool nitrum uh, sharpening pad. Uh, you can just get some sandpaper, and, like put it on a piece of uh, hard material, <laughs> block of wood. Yeah, you could also just like put the piece of sandpaper on a table and you're just gonna wanna rub a piece of charcoal um, around until you get like a nice point. Um, I was sort of like rolling the charcoal as I was doing it, so it had like a rounded. Some people might do like each sort of side of the square piece of charcoal. So they get a point like that. I just sort of like round. And you don't need it really sharp in the beginning. I kind of prefer it actually not being too sharp. And it's good to, um, after you take a break, just sort of like have a moment of really sort of standing back in your position and observing and making a handful of uh, sort of observations. I can see, um, like I was saying with anatomy, it can be helpful because it can sort of, um, this also just comes with experience with like doing portraits, um, but you can sort of like really pick out key um, sort of landmarks in the portrait that are helpful to constructing it. For example, like 
you know, the edge of the forehead. Um, I'm going to grab a little piece of paper towel. Um, and I can sort of soften it a little bit. I'm also going to grab a soft brush. Fan brush works or um, a nice like sable. And sort of like push the charcoal around. Soften it a bit. The brush does like damage the paper quite a bit. So basically anything touching the can the paper is going to damage it. So as you can see I'm being like quite um I am allowing myself to make marks and push things around but you do sort of want to be a little bit cautious of sort of every sort of mark that you're making. Because um, sometimes you can damage the paper and you can't really like move it all that much. But then again, this is a transfer drawing, so we're not being too precious. We're back from model break. Um, it's definitely important to make sure that your model's comfortable and gets breaks because you want to make sure that they come back <laughs> um, especially if you're doing commissions um, you don't want the sitter to have a sort of like um, like even if they're not doing I think VG LeBron said this like she's like always compliment your models this is a, this is a secret <laughs> she's like always compliment your models and tell them they're doing a really good job because um, then they'll be like happy to like sit and like they think they're doing a good job and they'll do like a better job um, and because if you like get sort of like upset with your model like then they'll have an upset face and I've seen it happen like and then their face just looks really grumpy and then you have a painting of a grumpy person and so it's like it's always good to like have like good record with the, the model um, I mean, I like to think that I'm just like a nice person, like <laughs> genuinely. <laughs> uh, but if you, that's something that you have to work on, I would recommend doing it because you don't want to have an unhappy model because then you'll have an unhappy painting or a painting of an unhappy person. <laughs> um, but yeah, so going in. So I'm going to like start working quite visually. This is the transfer drawing, so I'm not being like super precious um, with sort of like the final outcome of what it's going to look like. I'm just trying to get information down. Um, so that I can transfer it. You want to keep it simple because you can't transfer loads of information. Uh, it's more of just like shapes, but you want to keep it simple anyways, because I think that simpler paintings have more of an impact um, visually, uh, I don't know, I just, I'm always like sort of like under modeling rather than over modeling, meaning like I don't have loads of, uh, half tones, just try 
try and keep it simple. All right. So I'm glad that I sort of went in there. Um, can I just move some of this? Thanks. There we go. Yeah, another thing to keep in mind is that the model has to like get settled into the pose. Um, so that's another reason why it's like quite good to be a little bit looser when you're starting um, because gravity will like sort of settle in and the, the model will sort of get into like a, a default sort of position. Um, and You sort of have to allow that to happen so that you have a bit more consistency moving forward um, rather than sort of like trying to force something that might feel a bit more unnatural um, and make it easier on yourself and the model. Um, Yeah, and then if you're working from a photo or you can't really have the model come in, um, it's important to still, you know, work in the same method of uh, keeping everything simple, you know. Uh, and not getting distracted by all the information that you're seeing. Um, and trying to really make sure that I'm finding the Van Dyke Z because that's really gonna help me feel confident with my drawing of the features and face and which sort of how much it's turning. So I'm going to try and clean up sort of all these half tones that I have. Um, and unify the shapes as like a, um, with maybe more straight lines that I'll be able to transfer uh, more easily. So I'm going to try and get the bottom of the hair. Another thing is whenever I'm painting one side of the face, 
I want to be making sure that I'm paint. I'm also looking at the other side of the face or the neck. Always sort of painting them in unison, um, in consideration of each other, because sometimes you'll sort of end up painting an eye looking sort of turned this way and then the other eye turned that way and you get a little cross-eyed thing. So you want to make sure that you're keeping note of that um, as much as possible. Um, uh, very good. So, looks like it's life size. Um, Got the ear, top of the head. Um, I'm not super confident with the chin. Oh, another thing that's uh, a useful tool and to use when you can remember to is um, your mirror. <laughs> uh, I have a mirror, but it's in my bag. You also could use your phone. So basically uh, what you would do is I just close my eye, use my dominant eye, and then I put it up to between my open eye and my nose and it's sort of going perpendicular from my face and just you can see your drawing in the reflection of the screen and that sort of puts it in the sort of inverse of what you've been observing for the whole time so it's like you're seeing it fresh um and almost sort of like you're seeing it for the first time and so it'll allow you to really see those shapes um with a fresh eye and there's also a way that you can do it where you put it above your eyebrows and you sort of look up and you can see it upside down um and you can see the model and your drawing and sort of just flash your eyes back and forth and see what sort of stands out um and let's see So we've finished the transfer drawing, got all the portrait there. Um, feeling pretty confident with the structure of it and the, um, it looks like it's at a really good scale. Um, not too big, not too small. And I'm gonna go ahead and transfer The drawing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this plumb line vertically and that's going to help me um, make sure that when I transfer it it's vertical and it's not sort of tilting one way or the other so that I can line it up again. So, so I just did like vertical lines at the top and bottom. Um, then get my tracing paper, put it up there. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this uh, 2B pencil and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to trace all the information. I'm going to go ahead and secure the tracing paper. You don't want it moving around.
Very good. Now I'm going to get this pencil. I just have a soft uh, 2B and I'm going to go to the plumb line. Go ahead and trace that. And then I'm going to go ahead and trace my drawing. Um, keeping that sort of same idea of a uh, Those nice straight lines. S simplified. I'm going to lift it up, see how that's looking. Yeah. Might add That's why you got your plumb line to make sure it's in the right spot. a bit more information in the chin. Okay, so now take this tape off. Take the drawing down. Turn it around so that it's sort of in the inverse mirror and then tape it down and tape. And get my charcoal. You want a nice soft piece of charcoal and can I go ahead and trace over all of it again? I try and sort of like keep to the left and make my way to the right, starting at the top, making my way down so that I can just remember that I've gone over all the lines. And that way I don't smudge it. And so this charcoal is what's gonna be transferred onto the painting. Looks like I got it all. Take the tape off. Turn it around. So now this is my opportunity to sort of make adjustments um, in terms of where it's placed on the canvas. So 
I'm gonna see how that looks and tape it there and step back and yeah looks pretty good it's not too central it's a little bit to the right um, that's nice because his face is turning towards the left I think that I'm happy there's a fair amount I actually might raise it a bit I like it quite high Titian always had his portraits quite close to the top of the painting I think it yeah it's And then I'm going to grab that plumb line and it looks like they're lining up. I'm going to tilt the drawing just a little bit to the left so they line up a little bit better. And I think that's perfectly straight up and down. I'm going to make sure I tape it into place. Okay, let me just secure canvas, double check my plumb line. Yeah, I'm um, going to tilt it a little bit more to the left. You also want to make sure that your canvas is up vertically, up and down. Um, so line and you just rest it on the side of your um, canvas. And if it f goes along the side of the canvas, that means you've got a straight oh god so the canvas i know is is straight and so i have my plumb line lined up with the top mark and then i lined up with the bottom mark So you have to have a quite steady hand to do this. So my hand's resting on the top of my canvas. It's in the right place. I'm going to push the tape to the right place. You want to make sure that your transfer drawing is really secured and taped down. Because if you like sort of move it halfway through, it's a bit of a disappointment. So I got my pencil now and I'm just going to go over the marks, pushing them into the canvas with the pencil. I am going to actually sort of, yep, it's transferring, so that's good. Starting from the left, going to the right. Make my way down. Making sure I get everything nicely pushed, the charcoal pushed off the paper and on to the canvas. And usually I'd probably just like do this on the ground. It's a bit more like stable. Um, but works doing it up here too. Okay. Let's see. Moment of truth. There we go. I got it transferred. So as you saw, we transferred the drawing um, while we were taking a break. Um, I'm going to be 
uh, now sort of going over it in paint um, with some raw umber. Raw umber is good because it dries fast. You want to be painting quite like thinly in the beginning with more um, turpentine than oil because uh, you always want to be painting um, fat over lean. So fat being the oil and lean being less oil or like turpentine. So I have my turpentine and I have my oil. I guess this might be difficult to open. Um, it gets quite sticky. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, so you can use linseed oil. This is a little bit of um, sun thickened linseed oil that I made. I'll like go into a bit more depth about what that is and how one would make it. I'm just gonna go in with like a small brush for now. Um, bit of paper towel. Okay. So I dip my brush in the oil and sort of like rub it on my palette to get rid of the excess oil. Rub it on the paper towel, get it in the raw umber. And like I said, you don't want it to be too fat. So I get some turpentine and get it nice and thin. And you know, oil takes a long time to slow, or a long time, a slow time to dry. So that's why you want to be using more lean um, paint with the turpentine, so that it dries faster and that you can paint over it. Um, I have my model here, so I'm going to be using the transfer drawing as like a suggestion. <laughs> but since I have the model here, I'm still gonna be looking at him. And I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that the transfer drawing and the model are lined up. So I got my brush and the eyebrow lines up. Let's see if the bottom of the chin, yeah, the bottom of the chin lines up. And the top of the head, yeah, lines up great. Yeah, so I'm just going in with this raw umber and that's going to be sort of my shadow value for now. You want to try and keep the shadows as thin as possible and maybe sort of build up the lights. Um, and you want to just be painting quite thinly in the beginning to begin with. Where you're still sort of resolving the stuff and making it easy to move around. Again, not really using any oil, sort of just painting with turpentine, keeping it thin. Fat over lean is like definitely something you want to be sort of practicing, but I remember sort of like stressing out about that loads when I was in school and it's like, I think it's pretty like, so it's just like, just don't paint with loads of oil <laughs> and 
you'll be all right. If you paint with turpentine in the beginning, don't paint too thickly, and then just slowly develop layers and layers of paint. It's gonna get fatter and fatter. It sounds kind of like really scientific and intimidating, but it's just like, so far none of my paintings have melted. <laughs> so. Okay, I can see the, the side of his head, or the side of his face, rather, could be pushed out a little bit. So I'm gonna go in with my paper towel, sort of push it back. You can do that with turpentine if you need to, but I think it's a bit better to do it just like a dry piece of paper towel. See, I'm doing a bit of a uh, finger painting, which I like to do. <laughs> it's a nice way to sort of soften edges and just sort of push the paint where you want. And you can see, I don't want to be getting into too many half tones but I am starting to get into that a little bit just a little bit and then I'm going to push the top of the ear Okay, I guess I'll go in and place those shoulders real quick. So I'm going to be setting up my palette. Um, So uh, let's scoop off this bromber. And so I'm gonna be starting with, uh, here I have some Michael Harding Kremnitz White. Um, that is, uh, a lead white. I have like a, a Rublev lead white that I use sometimes. Um, another thing that um, that I do sometimes <laughs> is I'll squirt my uh, paint onto a piece of paper towel and the paper towel will absorb the oil because sometimes they're too oily. Um, and I like to keep it a little bit more dry because I can always just add the oil with my medium. Um, yeah. So there's a bit of lead white. You want to be careful when you're using lead white because it's quite toxic. Just like don't put it in your mouth. Um, then I'll be using some old Holland Yellow Ochre Deep. This is like a pretty limited palette. And then after that, I have some uh, Raw Sienna Michael Harding. No, sorry, this is Old Holland. Old Holland Raw Sienna. And then I got some Michael Harding Genuine Chinese Vermilion. It's the expensive stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like it. <laughs> I don't really like painting with earth reds. 
Um, so, oh, also, especially when you're, I don't usually use cadmium orange, but if you're painting like a darker skinned model, you definitely want some cadmium orange because uh, there's just like really nice, like, uh, like warm, deep, like uh, flesh tones that you can't really get without it. Um, and then ivory black. That's uh, Old Holland. So you... if we're just painting a pretty simple portrait. I try and keep my palette as limited as possible. It makes it just simpler for me. Um, don't really need blue. Um, I might use it, might not, but you can get like a decent blue with just the white and the ivory black. So I'm now going to be mixing some uh, colors for the background. I'm gonna see how close that is. Looks pretty close. So, now that I have a nice pile of it, I'm gonna paint the background. I'm just sort of scrubbing that in. Let's see. Yeah. It's a little, um, like, a little warm and red, but like I said, I'm gonna be doing layers of paint on top of each other. So it might be nice to kind of have that red shine through. I might um, just go ahead and put in my lightest light. Um, we got this nice white shirt. So again, loading up my brush, getting that white. I mean, I don't want it to be pure white. So I'm gonna get a little bit of my background. And, and, Put in that light shape. I will be honest with you guys. Um, normally, I would like have what you want. I didn't. I didn't get to cover the imprimatura because this is obviously white canvas that's been um, toned, and you do that with you know raw umber, black and white, raw sienna. Um, I actually honestly just do it with like my paint cleaner that I wash my brushes in. There's like sludge on the bottom. <laughs> and I just sort of use that to stone my canvases and it's like the perfect like gray. And um, you want it to be a mid-tone. And I'll, I'll talk about like mid-tones um, and stuff like that more, but you want it to be a mid-tone so that you can paint sort of the darks and the lights into it, where this is clearly kind of like a light. Um, not really that much of a mid-tone. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put in my darkest dark. And so I'm just, you know, I'm definitely trying to make sure I don't have white in here, um, but I'm just sort of getting a little bit of orange, a little bit of red, raw sienna. I don't use loads of yellow ochre in my darks because like I said, it's um, raw sienna is a little bit more transparent. Um, and I try and keep my darks like a bit more transparent if I can. I'm just gonna go ahead and sort of lay that in.
and I got a bit of glare. And one way to fix glare is sort of tilt your canvas forward if you can. Or that seemed to help a little bit or just tilt it away from the window. That seemed to help. And so I'm trying to make sure that I have a brush for my darks and I have a brush for my background and I have a light or a brush for my um, lights. All right. Now I'm going to go ahead and find a few more darks in the face. I'm going to go ahead and mix up a quick uh, value for the shirt. A bit more of all the other colors. Okay. And get some more white. And as you can see, I sort of just have like one single value for the big shape because there's obviously a lot of like nuances and shuttle like value changes and color changes, and, but just keeping it simple. Now I'm gonna go and now I'm gonna mix a, um, a flesh tone. So I'm going to Get a brush. Get my oil. Not too much white. Lots of orange. Red. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, it could be still more orange maybe the yellow ochre will help me get that warmth let's try so this is a uh, basically there's like I try and think of it as like four there's like four values if you're really gonna try and keep it simple. There's like the darks, the midtones, the light, and then the highlights. And right now we have the darks, and then we're not really doing the midtones because we're just trying to keep it simple. Those will come later in the transitions. And then the light, and then the highlights we're also not doing. And that would be, you know, these nice cool highlights on the forehead or in the eyes, the tip of the nose. So we're just working with light and dark. And I don't, I want to, you know, make sure I'm like staying under control, not getting it too messy. 
but I definitely am sort of making adjustments where I think necessary in terms of drawing and shapes, etc. You can tell I'm using quite like a, a broad brush. And I'm also not painting with loads of paint. I'm sort of just like scraping it in. And I'm losing a bit of information, but it's important to keep the painting soft. You don't want to have these like thickly painted brush strokes next to another thickly painted brush stroke with a really like sh sharp line, sort of like what I have there. So what I'm going to do, I sort of just like soften it and I'll be able to go in later and put like a nice brush stroke that is more exact as I get more, more specific with my drawing. I mean, I've lost like quite a bit of my drawing, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> Where'd he go? He's gone. Okay. Cute. Okay. Very good. You so Thank you so much. Yeah. I'll find you again. Don't worry. <laughs>So I'm going to be making some uh, medium. I uh, have some Canada balsam here. This is from Rublev. Uh, you really just use whichever Canada balsam. Uh, I know there's a few other brands that make it. Um, just 100% Canada balsam. You also couldn't use Venetia, Venetian balsam. I don't have like loads of experience with that. Um, but this is what I use. It's like super thick, super sticky. So um, thankfully it's quite a warm day, but sometimes you have to like run it underwater or maybe like stick it in the sun, hot water, run it under hot water to get it sort of flowing. And it takes a while, but I just pour the uh, Canada balsam into this jar and I sort of just let it like sit there for a bit. Sometimes I'll just like go like that. I'm just wait. <laughs> and so what you're going to be doing is, um, basically a quarter camel balsam, a quarter uh, some mineral spirit, turpentine. I um, usually use gamblin gamsol, which is like an odorless mineral spirit. And then it's half something in linseed oil. Um, this is refined linseed oil that I made, I, I sort of made a tray out of lead um, and then poured like a ball or two into these trays of lead of uh, something or of refined linseed oil. And then I put a glass, uh, a sheet of glass over it, or maybe like um, some saran wrap might work, uh, just so that bugs or dust don't get in the oil. And then I stick it in the sun. And depending on like where you are and how sunny it is, it usually just takes about like a week and a half, two weeks, maybe a bit longer for it to start thickening and it absorbs the lead. Um, let's see. Yeah, you also can buy something in linseed oil. Um, and, but this is how I make it. And I, I make sure I'm stirring it. You don't need to stir it too much in the beginning, um, but that sort of like helps get the lead into the oil. Um, and, and then it starts to thicken up and sometimes even like a film sort of like a skin on top will develop and you want to like mix that in and it starts to get thicker and thicker from the sun. Um, and this just allows the uh, medium to have like a really nice um, like body to it as well as with the, the balsam. It gives it a really nice sort of like drag um, and it, uh, 
also has a sort of like glow to it, like almost like a varnish. Um, and the lead, the reason I soak, I, I soak them in lead trays is the lead um, makes the paint dry super fast, which is really nice. Um, so I'm basically painting like a la prima on top of what I was painting yesterday, like every day. Um, depends on where you are, how dry and how hot it is. But like most of the time my painting will be dry the very next day. And so that's one reason why when I'm painting too, I'm being really cautious of like what edges I'm leaving because they will dry and I won't be able to soften them the next day. So I'm always making sure I have like not too sharp of brush strokes and also scraping to get to any excess paint off. Um, and I'll explain that further. But um, sometimes I made it, it's like super orange. This one's really white, but you'll start to like see these like strings of like white develop in the the lead and, or in the oil and that's the lead and then once it gets to a consistency where I don't know it's like a it's not super thick it, and it depends on how you like it I don't like it super thick um, so once you just think that it has a good consistency I take it out um, put it in a jar <clears throat> so I have basically what I do is I just pour in some can of balsam and then I eyeball it and I pour in the the same amount of turpentine. So I sort of double it. And then I'll do the same thing um, with that mixture of cannabis balsam and turpentine. I'll then add the same amount of uh, sun thick and linseed oil. So it's a quarter, a quarter, and then the remaining half is this. If that makes sense. <laughs> I'm getting my turpentine. And I can just see where the can of balsam is. And I'm just gonna pour, and it's nice because they, they sort of remain separate from each other. So you can actually quite clearly see what amounts that you're putting in. And then I'm just gonna eyeball it. Pour in some sun thick and linseed oil. Yeah, let's see how that looks. Give it a good shake. There we go. Looks good, it smells great. Canada balsam has like a real nice, like sort of pine smell to it. Um, so then what I do is like I said, I have my medium cups here and I just pour a bit of turpentine in one of the cups. So for the extra sort of like thin brush strokes that I want, I can just dip my brush into there. You want to be really careful with your medium because it does have sun thick and linseed oil in it, so there's a lot of lead. Um, you know, just like wear gloves, wash your hands, don't eat while you're painting. Um, yeah, and then I just pour the medium into my other cups. And then one thing to keep in mind is like I try to make sure that if there's like leftover medium in my cups that I like clean it out because if you let it leave it in there for a day or two it starts to get um, sticky and thick um, and then your brushes go funny. Getting back into the pose. And then my easel's in the right place. <clears throat> and now I have the canvas like fully covered. 
um, I try and always do that definitely within the first day, if not even like the first session or two, if I can. Um, cause then now there's not too much of like a visual difference between my painting and sort of the whole environment. <clears throat> there's like, uh, really nice sort of like mid range tones everywhere, but my drawing has sort of, uh, faded away a little bit. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is get like a sort of medium sized brush here and I'm going to try and find the drawing again, really go in with the Van Dyke Z and sort of find the drawing again. So I dip my brush in the medium, wipe off a bit of excess, and I'm going to make a sort of shadow color. So that's raw sienna, vermilion, and ivory black. Some cat orange. And it's nice. I kind of like will make little piles. Like this is a more like cooler yellow pile. And then this is a redder pile. And then I can even mix them together. And they're the same value. They just have different sort of temperatures and hues. And it definitely needs to be a little bit darker and a little bit redder. And I'm just looking up at my model. Okay. And then you can turn a little bit this way. Yeah, that's good. Okay. We'll just see. It needs to be a bit like darker and warmer yeah just adjust as you go and like if it's really like far off the brush stroke you just put down and you put it down too thickly you could go and scrape it off with a palette knife <clears throat> um, and this just and <clears throat> you definitely don't want to be going in with like pure black um I'm always sort of understating my darks because you don't want to have like false accents. If you can, you know, but you, do, you still want nice dark unified darks. Um, but just don't go in too dark too soon because then you can sort of go in at the very end and add these really nice accents where you, you need them. The very next day. And so that's one reason why when I'm painting too, I'm being really... What I'm going to go ahead and do is now sort of key my, my light. The lightest light... It might change a little bit as the, the light changes. Sometimes I mean, the thing about painting from nature or from life one second, is you'll see these like, uh, you'll see these sort of changes in these varieties. Um, and it's just about being conscious of them and then making decisions. So you don't want to like chase it though. Um, Cause then you'll just never really end up with a clear image. But if you can observe the differences and then make a decision on which ones you want to choose I think that's what sort of makes the painting painted from life 
a little bit, feel a bit more alive. Because <laughs> you get those, like, those variations um, that can only really be observed when you're looking at it in front of you. The what amounts that you're putting in. Gonna go in with my light. A little So it's very cool, the light, and a little bit pink. So I'm putting a little bit of everything, but mostly red, white, and black. And yeah, we're just gonna give this a go, see what it looks like. And Yeah, and the you see through a lot of the you see through highlights. I used to avoid putting highlights in for so long, um, but they really help you see like the proportions and the drawing. You know, you'll hear me say things like, "Oh, you know, use big brushes, keep it simplified." Those are all good like rules to follow, but that doesn't mean you have to like do them for the entire first couple of days. So you sort of like keep that mindset, but break the rules every once in a while. So I'm gonna go ahead and get a smaller brush. I have a sable here. I, I, I use quite a lot of sables, but usually I'm using bristles. Um, they're filberts. Um, So this is, these are going to be the highlights for like the nose and the highlight on the nose is actually like incredibly descriptive. If it's too big, too sharp, too small, it really will sort of describe the shape of the nose quite a lot. So be very sensitive with that. The white of the eyes are never like super white. I sort of like to understate them anyways, <clears throat> in terms of like their brightness and then like, and keep them really soft and then sort of just paint. <clears throat> ever so slightly brighter on top of it. So I'm getting a small filbert sable here. This is a Rosemary & Co. Pure Sable Series 91, size four. I think I'm gonna go ahead and make a value for not the highlight, but the light of um, his skin. So, and I'm like, I try and be exact as I can be, but I'm also a little bit lenient because say it's like just a little bit brighter or like say a little bit too pink or something. I'm gonna be doing so many edits and I'm going to be putting sort of like layers and layers of paint that the layers of paint are going to sort of make the desired color that I want. 
Um, I guess that's painting indirectly. Um, but I definitely paint very directly as well. So it's like the combination of the, like, of the two. So painting directly would be mixing the exact value and color that you want and then applying that relatively thickly onto the painting and the sort of like shape um, that you want. And then painting indirectly would be either glazing or scumbling. Um, glazing is painting a darker value onto a lighter value very thinly. So with lots of either medium or turpentine. Um, and um, scumbling is painting a lighter value onto a darker value um, thinly transparently, um, semi-opaque. <laughs> so, but you, I mean, I kind of do like a combination of it all. I'm actually going to um, oil out my darks here. Um, ivory black has a tendency to sort of sink in quite a lot. And that's when the paint sort of, uh, the ground of the canvas like sucks the oil out of the paint and it becomes sort of like chalky and lighter than it, the true sort of value of the paint. So what I do in order to fix that is I just get a little bit of medium and then a little bit of terps. And you wanna make sure that your painting is dry when you do this. Um, and so I can feel that it's totally, uh, actually, <laughs> well, just if it's not totally dry, be careful. <clears throat> it's kind of nice because you can sort of like use oiling out to like either unify or soften things that you want. Um, but yeah, just getting the oil and sort of resaturating the paint. And then this side of the hair has a little bit more light in it. So I might add a little bit more raw sienna. If there's like light in the hair, you wanna make your, it, you wanna make it lighter with sort of um, any color but white. <laughs> because once you put white into the hair, it goes gray. And Arnie clearly doesn't have gray hair. So I'm gonna try and keep it like nice and uh, chromatic. Um, but there does come a point where you do start to need to add a little bit of white into the highlights. And I used to sort of avoid painting the hair and just keeping it as like a really um, like abstract flat shape for a long time because I just didn't know how to paint hair. And then I realized once I like finally took the step to paint it properly, it adds like so much depth to the painting um, because then you just have light sort of on everything and it just like gives a lot more atmosphere.
as you can see, I'm I'm sort of glazing. Um, and I don't really want to be doing this right now <laughs> because it's starting to become overmodeled. So it's nice. I got like some dark half tones and some transitions. I'm going to go back in and sort of paint the light shape. But in terms of canvas, I, I like it I like a little bit more coarse. I, I'll use um, sort of linen or jute. Um, it's nice when it's a little bit more coarse because um, you can get a little bit more Mm. How would you describe it? Yeah, it's less, um, it allows the paint to sort of have like a breath to it. It's easy to apply a brush stroke that's not going to be like really sharp and graphic. You can sort of like um, put paint down in a way where I don't know. I, th I find that you can get like a wider range of uh, like brushstroke quality with like more coarse um, canvases. Because if you want like a really sharp brushstroke, you sort of just like apply like a really thick, wet um, brush. If you paint the um, shadows but more thinly they'll become like transparent sort of how they are in nature um, and then if you paint the the lights more thickly they'll um, sort of glow um, which is nice yeah I mean values are like super important uh, I would definitely like maintain a focus on getting like the value relationships um, because if you have like if you have that I think colors is pretty like innate thing that hopefully you have like Like the, it's something that you just sort of develop over time. Um, but values is something that you really sort of have to like train yourself to um, get. Um, and I think that has like a, a bigger impact on painting than like colors. I mean, I like colors, but. So I'm gonna go ahead and paint. I'm not liking the way the, the the hair and the background are looking sort of separate from each other and even the face a little bit. So I'm going to sort of soften this hairline. I feel like so much is conveyed in shoulders, um, but they also like are incredibly, they just can move a lot. And so they're always like, and they have like such like specific like angles to them. So I find myself trying to pay pretty close attention to shoulders. Um, You definitely want to be painting the painting as like a whole. Like you can see that I'm I'm developing the painting, because um, it's really easy just to focus on the the face, and just sometimes you can get stuck working on the same thing over and over again, and then you don't realize that if you just worked on the rest of the painting, it sort of helps you see what needs to be done in other areas, and sometimes 
it's not really much or anything at all that needs to be done. <laughs> you just needed to finish the painting. <laughs> um, let's see. Really trying to place the light on his cheekbone. <clears throat> and you don't want to get too hung up on reflective light, but especially in darker skin, you can notice the reflective light a little bit more. And I think it, it's important to sort of subtly indicate it. Um, otherwise it looks a little bit flat. I have these sort of very old brushes, um, very soft brushes. And that allows me that when I paint wet into wet, first I'm not using loads of paint to where it's like very, there's not going to be like a, a, a sharp line between I, if I use a brush like this and I sort of like maneuver it um the paint will sort of like blend into each other um and create a really nice transition and if it doesn't i can actually just go in with my finger and sort of like smudge them together and then there's some edges there that i'd like to be softer so i'm getting i'll just go ahead and i'll use the sable a nice large sable it's really soft and I'm dipping my medium into it. There's no paint on it. I'm rubbing the medium off. I mean, you can even do it with no medium, but the paint might stick to the brush too much. So with the oil on the brush, it allows the paint not to get too stuck to the brush, but for me to be able to use this and sort of brush those values together. So you can see I'm like drawing while I'm softening. Painting the background, like the right value, I found was like incredibly helpful because it just allows you to see the, all the relations. And then it helps you like just see the drawing and everything that sort of just needs to be adjusted. Um, so the sooner you can get that relationship established of the background and the portrait, the easier you'll be able to get going. Oh yeah. make sure that you have as many brushes as you can sort of get because as you can see I'm using all these brushes and they all have <clears throat> different shapes and sizes and softness so it will allow me to sort of manipulate the paint how I want um, you get like a nice variety of brush strokes and edges and and if one of your brushes starts to get you know I already have like a, a hairbrush somewhere in here but I think it's sort of got mixed in with the background so it has white in it now so I had to just pick up another brush so that's why you need as many as you can get because as soon as it gets dirty, you're definitely going to want to sort of put that down. Um, otherwise, your shadows will get all chalky and... You know, we got like a nice sort of 
chroma monochromatic composition with lots of sort of beige. And then we have this um, earring. There's like a touch of color. Um, also sort of helps us find the, the edge of his face. Um, Cause it gets, there's some like nice lost edges with the hair and his beard and the side of his face in the shadow. But it's also kind of nice to bring out some edges. Put a little pink in the lips, but I'm gonna go ahead and get a little bit darker, cooler red for the upper lip. Upper lip is always a little bit darker because it's facing downwards, away from the light. So this is very much directly painting. And this is where you can get some really nice rhythms and uh, brush strokes without having to worry about the drawing being like really exact or anything. So have fun with it. Yeah, it just it makes the whole painting have like much more interesting rhythm and life any any sort of tricks you can use to your advantage like clothes hair jewelry try not to paint the background like a a house or a wall where you just paint it up and down, up and down. Try to have some variety in the brush strokes. Look at paintings that you like, see what they do. So I'm going to just turn this way. Yeah. I'm going to just be continuing to soften a few areas um, and maybe add some more accents. I do this with a palette knife, a brush, a brush with some medium. I'm doing it with my fingers. Let's see, um, actually I might get a little bit of cadmium red for the earring and the light. I like those bits of gold in the hair, so I'm going to go for that. Just white, a little bit of yellow ochre, a little bit of black.
keeping it loose. You don't want like, there's like form to the shoulders. So you wanna make sure that you're making them turn. So when I do those brush strokes, there's sort of like a value in between the background and the shirt. It's like some coolness to the neck. I wanna make sure that I'm getting So I think I'm going to go first with just a few dark accents. And I've just built, I've been slowly building up to this moment where I'm getting the accents darker and darker. So that's why I didn't go straight in. It's real dark. I could even go a bit darker. These are my final touches I'm doing here. Really trying to find the character and the eyes. Getting the right shapes and stuff. And then a cooler dark for that eyebrow. Really looking at the gesture. Okay, and then I'm gonna get a tiny, tiny, tiny little brush. Get a little bit of medium, not too much. Really load up my brush with just pure flake white, rub it around, get some on the tip of my brush and then place the highlights in the eye. And these can be really tricky, but you wanna make sure that you're placing them in the right place. Otherwise it looks like he'll be looking off in a different direction. Mine looks a little too high, so I'm just going to go ahead and too high and to the right. There we go. I'm like, you can't make me stop. <laughs> okay, 